Police have captured the man accused of shooting a mountain home airman yesterday morning in a local laundromat. You can imagine how some parents felt when they learned that ACHD has decided that a school zone here is no longer needed. But here in Boise tonight, the Treasure Valley got a sneak peek. Not only is this hotel over 150 years old, but people died here. And some think it's haunted, so we're going to find out. I just landed. It was an incredible ride. There will be six of these F-16s at the show this weekend. They went out of their way to come to this crosswalk, just like their parents had taught them. So the movie finished up about a half hour ago, but you can see here we still have a lot of people mingling, and they're actually getting autographs from one of the stars. I'm most proud of what we showed on there where they spun me really quickly four times, just around and around <laughs> and around. And that was the time where I almost got sick, but, yeah. but I made it. I made it through. Well, seven more people have come forward to say they were sexually abused by staffers at the Idaho Department Detention Center. Taylor has been carrying her late partner Jean's ashes with her as she moves place to place. Now she tells me she's just breaking even, but hopes to make big bucks in the business of pleasure. <laughs> People are at the wall posing for selfies and putting them on social media. We even get to pose with one of the stars of the film. He started touching me. He started like undressing me. And I like, I try to grab him, like try to grab his hand to put it like, no. And I kept saying, no, dad, no. What are you doing? And He was saying, no, you're safe, you're safe. I love you. Kamiley, now 18 years old, with her abuser locked away, finds hope in sharing her story. You sure? About the abuse she suffered at the hands of her adoptive father. It started when I was maybe three months away from my seventh birthday. His famous words were, I was doing this because I love you. She has a purpose in sharing to encourage children who are being abused to speak up. If they are in that situation. I want them to know that there are people that know, that understand. And to be honest, I want them to know that they're a survivor. And that oh, you have to tell somebody. Because Kamiley kept it a secret for too long. Seven and a half years. Canyon County Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Erica Callen says stories like Kamiley's are far too common. Three years is the average time from the chi time the child is offended on until the child actually comes forward and tells. Reasons children hide abuse share a common thread. The abuser is someone they trust or their parents trust. As a parent, we don't leave our kids with people we don't trust. It's always somebody that's trusted. For Kamiley, it was the person she was supposed to trust the most. He would do anything to be alone with me. He'd do it in cars. And if I would refuse, I'd kick him a few times. And he'd slap me or he'd punch me. He'd grab my hair. He'd hit my head against something. Sharing seems to be working because watching us talk is 15-year-old Leona, whose abuser, her stepfather, pleaded guilty and is awaiting sentencing. Yeah, kind of inspired me. The shy teenager says she's also ready to share. I was scared to tell. Both these girls kept the secret because of guilt, fear, shame. I did. I felt like it was my fault. There was times where I wanted to tell, like my family. I, I was, just, but every time I just like go back and like didn't want to. Why? Why didn't you want to? I was scared. He. If, thinking he'd like do something to my brothers and sisters and his daughters or my mom. The biggest thing that I recommend to parents is simply talk to your child. Tell your child. Talk to your child about good touch and bad touch and explain to them that if someone touches them that they need to come and tell even if they're told that something bad is going to happen. Today Kamiley is working to heal. I was pretty broken. And she has a message for Leona and others who are hurting. I will not let my past reflect on my future. That's beautiful. Did that take a long time to learn? It did. I live every day to help somebody because I know for a fact there are little girls still going through that in their life. And I just want to find a way to get it out there and let them know that they're not alone, that the best thing to do is not feel like you're the bad person. 
because no, you're not the bad person. One common theme in abuse stories is that the abuser puts himself in a position of trust to gain that trust from both parents and the victim. It's referred to as grooming the victim. Tomorrow we'll learn signs of grooming and how to pinpoint these signs in children who might be suffering. In studio, Lauren Johnson, today six on your side. Not only is this hotel over 150 years old, but people died here. And some think it's haunted. So we're gonna find out. I think every place is haunted if it's old enough. We'll all be ghosts someday. It's a tough way to look at life, isn't it? Roger Nelson owns the Idaho Hotel at the center of town, a place he calls home. Silver City was acquired by people who love it. You will not meet prouder old men of their shacks than the old men that own these shacks up here. Nelson's old shack is worn and full of history, and the town also old with rich stories to tell. His wife, Jerry, is eager to share. Some people definitely say, I cannot stay in that room again. They don't like me in that room. We had this one lady that would come back every year, and she loved room 26. She said the spirits are very, they like her. We've had several people say, ever see a guy in a long rider coat? And it's like, well, no, we haven't. Roger and Jerry share stories of a man, or is it a ghost, seen wearing a long riding coat. He's believed to be Samuel Lockhart. J. Marion Moore and Samuel Lockhart had a shootout, and Samuel Lockhart always wore the long rider coat. The gunfight was over a mining dispute, and both men died in Silver City. J. Marion Moore was buried in Idaho City, but Samuel Lockhart, well, people say he's still here, inside this hotel, and they say there's someone else, a ghost walking the hallways in a tuxedo. Okay, the guy in the tux is Odie Broombaugh, an old owner of the hotel, who actually shot himself in the south wing of the hotel. We're told that ghosts have shown up in this mirror in photographs. I snapped selfie after selfie looking for any ghostly photo bomb, hoping I might meet Odie, but nothing. Okay, so this is room 10. This is the one where the lady at the lace. Guests have seen her floating in this room, going in and out of walls, floating on the balcony, and even screaming. Oh my gosh. If they're here <coughs> and they're haunting it, they're reasonably friendly. Have try you ever had anyone so scared they we, left? We try to keep that to a minimum. <laughs> yeah, I've had people check in and, and back out at 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning. At 2.30 in the morning? That's when we did experience something. Our photographer, Doug, woke up at that exact time, turned on his audio recorder and rolled over to go back to sleep. The recorder captured this electronic voice phenomena, or EVP. Did you hear that? Listen closely. Was it a voice from the spirit realm? Hard to tell, but Doug did toss and turn. So it could have been Odie or Samuel or the lady in lace saying, don't move. I did it. I spent the night in this hotel that's over 150 years old. I slept great like a baby, or maybe they were those ghosts that were helping me sleep. Whether or not it's haunted, you'll have to find out for yourself. In Silver City, Lauren Johnson, Idaho on your side. It only takes one second. Just one second. Not watching what you're doing. Not seeing what's in front of you. And you have, you have wrecked a family for the rest of their lives. It was Easter Sunday and Mindy's three children got on their bikes to come to a local park. They went out of their way to come to this crosswalk, just like their parents had taught them, and raced to push the button. That's what Olivia's mom, Mindy, says happened the day that changed their family's lives forever. Well, my husband and I, it's been the hardest thing you can ever imagine to go through. Almost six months after the collision that took 13-year-old Olivia's life, final reports this month say that the teen is the one at fault, the driver who hit her, innocent. As a parent, you never want to lose your child. But for them to come back and say that my child was at fault and that this lady had no liability, no responsibility. It was like they were ripping our hearts out all over again. 
The final reasoning in the report, there was no walk signal for Olivia, her brother and her sister to cross the five lane road. They went down that street. They pushed the button to activate the light. And the light was activated and my son saw the white light. In police reports, the driver explains that she could not see Olivia because the sun was in her eyes. I would get, give anything in the world to have Olivia back. I wish that, that we could go back and that this never happened. That that woman stopped driving because she couldn't see. As she looks through the report, Mindy aches for what is not mentioned as evidence, an interview with Olivia's brother with police an hour after the collision. He is only seven, but he remembers. He knows exactly what happened. Listen closely to the audio from that interview. Did you guys hit the light to go, or what were the lights doing? We hit the light. I don't really know what it was, but we just, my sister told us to go, so we started going. And it and was really turning white, and it didn't turn red, and then she got hit. That information is not in the report. Listen again. To Mindy, it's clear. And it was turning white, and it didn't turn red, and then she got hit. He remembers hearing and feeling the gush of air going by him when that car hit and killed his sister. And turning and seeing her fly. And that's his word. She flied. Jason Maestas witnessed the tragic accident. It'll be embedded in my head forever. He was front and center. Here, stopped at the stop sign, waiting to you know turn on the U-stick. When I saw Olivia get hit right here in this crosswalk, I noticed that there were some kids getting ready to cross the crosswalk, and the light you know turned red. I, I do recall it being red because that's why I did not make my turn on the U-stick. A week later, Jason, who has a background in criminal justice, got a follow-up call from a detective. I had the feeling they were, you know, trying to get me to change how I wrote my statement. I actually truly regret not coming forward sooner and letting the public know what really happened to Olivia. For Olivia's family, they say that finally talking about what happened that day is about one thing, justice for their angel, Olivia. We want justice for Olivia and the truth to come out. That's what we're looking for. That was Lauren Johnson reporting. On Your Side is continuing to look at evidence in this case. Lauren reached out to the Boise Police Department about the final report into Olivia's death. They shared a statement which read in part, quote, Officers, too, were touched by the tragedy. Their investigation was immediate, methodical, and thorough, and involved many witnesses who helped provide a large amount of evidence. The prosecutor's decision after careful review that the actions by the driver will not result in criminal charges in no way lessens the heart-rendering consequences of the collision.